Hello, my name is Linda Newsom, and I'm here to talk to you today about some simple strategies to help you develop a beautiful indoor garden filled with lush, healthy houseplants. The prescription for healthy houseplants has four parts. Know your indoor environment, know what the plant needs to thrive, put the right plant in the right place, and you'll know that from the information you gather from the first two points. Lastly, observe how your plants are doing on at least a weekly basis. Now, there are, nobody has a perfect indoor environment, but it's important for you to know what you are offering to your plants. So the first thing you should consider is the light that you already have available. <clears throat> You need to know what direction the room faces. Does it get morning sun or afternoon sun? That makes a difference to your plants. If you're getting morning sun, the room is facing to the east. That's a nice gentle sun. If you're getting afternoon sun, that's sun coming in from the west and it's more intense. So you have to decide which place would suit your plant better. Now, there are other things that you can do to enhance the quality of light coming into your room. The first one is keep your windows clean. You would be amazed at what a difference that makes. And also keep the leaves of the plants clean. I have an artist brush that I use to dust off the tops of the leaves now and again, so they can absorb the maximum amount of sunlight. And of course, you can always add artificial light if necessary. The next thing to think about is temperature. You need to keep it consistent. Plants do not like abrupt changes in temperature. It puts them into shock. So during the day, they like the temperature to be between 65 and 75 degrees. At night, they like it a little cooler, between 60 and 65 degrees. <clears throat> and of course, you know enough to keep plants away from drafts, heat vents, and space heaters. Next is humidity. That's very important for plants and you need to do all you can to maximize it. The ideal level is between 40 and 50%. And that's hard to achieve during the winter heating season. So some things you can do is to put rocks in a saucer and fill it with a little water about halfway up the sides of the rocks. You wanna keep the top of the rocks dry so you're putting the plant on a dry surface. If you fill the saucer too much and the plant is sitting in water, it's going to absorb it and it may develop, may develop root rot. You also can group your plants together as you see in the photo, that helps. And you can even give your plants a steam bath by bringing them into the bathroom when someone is taking a shower. There are also some other things you can do. You can buy a simple spray bottle, like you see in the photo, and mist your plants. You'll notice the plant that I have there, it's sitting in that uh, saucer of rocks and water, but I also mist it every day. In the corner of the uh, photo, you see a table thermometer, and this thermometer also shows the humidity so that you can keep track of what's going on in your room. The photo on the other side shows a diffuser filled with plain water. And you can see how it's bathing that plant in a moist mist. And that's really very good for the plant. And my diffuser, oh, it lasts for about an hour and a half. So it really does the plant a lot of good. Now we come to the second part of our prescription, the part that deals with the plant's growth requirements. And there's a little thing that can tell you an awful lot, and that's a plant tag. It's especially important when you're thinking about purchasing a plant. You can look on the back of the tag and it will give you a thumbnail sketch of the basic requirements for growth. So this way you can decide whether that plant belongs in your house or not. For instance, if the plant tag says, oh, well, this plant needs high humidity and low light. Well, you wouldn't buy it unless you could provide those conditions. Now, the plant tag will also give you the Latin or botanical name for the plant. 
And this is handy if you want to replace the plant with exactly the same plant, or if you want to purchase an additional one. If you go by the common name, you may not get the same plant because several plants can have the same common name. Now this botanical name also helps you to Google further information about your plant because that plant tag can't tell you everything you need to know to sustain healthy growth. There are many, I'm sure you know, websites that are totally devoted to houseplants and they give you a lot of detailed information. I always call it a plant profile. And this profile will give you many details about how to water a plant, for instance. Some plants like to be kept evenly moist and some plants like to dry out between waterings. Well, the profile will tell you what your plant likes. The profile will also tell you the schedule for fertilization. It will tell you if the plant is susceptible to disease or pests. It will tell you also how to propagate the plant. I like to keep my profiles in a binder. Here's my binder. I save the uh, plant tag as well. This is open to peace lily. You know, as your collection of plants grows, it's really hard to keep all those details in mind. So I like to use my binder as a handy reference. Now I wanna talk about a few other things that are important for your plants. And the first one is watering. It's very important to water wisely because overwatering is the biggest plant killer there is. So it's important to know each plant's water requirements as I mentioned earlier. Well, now you know how to water the plant, you need to know when to water the plant. The easiest way is to take your index finger and plunge it into the dirt up to the first joint and just check, check the soil for dryness. Look at the color of the soil before watering. If it's light brown, that soil is probably dry. If it's darker in color, it's probably still moist. But if you want to be really exact about the moisture in that soil, you can buy a water meter. Very simple. You just stick it into the soil and the gauge, very easy to read. This particular one, if it goes to the red numbers, you know the soil is dry. If it goes to the blue numbers, it's too wet. And if it's in the middle where the green numbers are, it doesn't need to be watered. Now for some more watering wisdom. It's important to keep the soil around the plant loose because every time you water, you're compacting the soil in that pot. And that makes it harder and harder for the water to distribute evenly around the root wall. So you take a little fork and just loosen the soil all around the pot. So that improves the drainage. It's also important to water all around the plant. If you water the plant from the same spot every time, you're gonna create a little channel. The water's gonna go down that channel and it's only going to wet that area. So by watering all around the plant, the whole root wall will be watered. It's a good idea to give your plant a quarter turn each time you water so that all parts of the plant get access to the sun. And this helps your plant from leaning over. I'm sure you've all seen plants that lean to one direction. Well, by turning it around on a regular basis, you can avoid that. And of course, you know enough to keep a lot of water out of the saucer. If you're watering your plant and you see that saucer fill up with water, you know that you've overwatered the plant and that you have to get rid of that extra water. So if you are not using rocks in the saucer, all the water goes. And if you are using rocks, you make sure the water level is very low below the top of the rocks. Even plants need to observe good grooming. Grooming is your best defense against pests and disease. So you should groom your plant regularly. It's important to remove dead leaves and blossoms, to trim leafless stems, and to keep the soil free of debris. It's also important to pinch back the plant and to prune it to keep the plant's shape. This not only keeps the plant from getting leggy or overgrown, but it improves the air circulation within the plant 
and that also deters pests and disease. Let's talk a little bit about fertilizing. Now, I know many, many people, when they see a plant looking a little distressed, they say, oh, it must need a little food. I'll go and get some fertilizer. Well, that's always the wrong answer. The amount of fertilizer that a plant needs varies from plant to plant, and you really should do it according to a schedule, which, of course, a plant profile will tell you that. Fertilization is usually not required in the winter because the plant is not growing or blooming much. It's going into a rest period for dormancy. It's best to wait until new growth appears in the spring to start your fertilization. Repotting is important to think about too. As we said, plants need a rest period, usually in the winter. Now repotting always puts stress on a plant. So you don't want to repot when the plant is resting. It's best done in the spring before new growth appears or in late summer before the plant goes dormant. How do you know when to repot? Well, there are several signs. The top growth, if it's much larger than the pot, that's a sign. Also, if you see roots are growing out of the bottom of the pot, you know it's time to change. Now, when you're loosening the soil with a fork or putting your finger in the soil to test for dryness, if you feel more roots than soil in that pot, that's another sign that it's time to repot. It's always good to use a loose potting mix. I like to use two big scoops of regular potting soil to one scoop of perlite and one scoop of peat moss. And I repeat this over and over again until I have the amount of soil that I need in a large container. And I moisten it sli slightly. I don't like to put dry soil in the pot. By making it slightly moist, when you water the plant after you've finished your repotting, that moist soil will absorb the water more evenly. Always remember to select a new pot that is at least one size larger than the old one. Unfortunately, House plants do not last forever. Though some plants are very long lived, like the jade plant, the average house plant lasts about five years. You can keep the plant in your collection by propagating it, and this is usually done through cuttings. There are several methods for propagation, but this is the simplest one to use. Now, this is what I usually do I fill a double paper cup with perlite and I add water to wet it thoroughly. Then I clip the stem at a leaf node, dip the stem into rooting hormone, poke a hole in the perlite and insert the plant stem. Then I put the cup in an area that gets indirect sunlight for a few days. After a week or so, check for roots by tugging gently on the stem. If you feel resistance, it's time to pot it up. Now, not all plants like to be planted in perlite. Some of them like to be planted in water, like the pethos. It takes a long time to root it that way, but that's really the best way to do it. And again, you have to refer to the information you have about your plant to decide which is the best way to propagate it. But I like the perlite because, as you know, roots grow in the dark, they grow in dirt. So the perlite gives it a dark environment to grow in. And you'll find that if you leave it in there long enough, you're gonna get a nice sturdy root ball, which means that you have a better chance of that plant surviving its potting up. I wanna show you this picture. You see a, a cut, cutting that I took. I cut the stem a little below that last uh, leaf node to give me a little room. And I would just pluck off that last leaf make an angular cut by the node, and then stick it into the uh, rooting hormone, the paper cup with perlite, et cetera. And there you see the equipment that I use on the other side. Well, now we get to a topic that nobody likes to deal with, insects. Good sanitation, as I said before, is the best way to prevent pests on the plants you already own. Now, the strategies that I'm going to talk about 
are called cultural controls, and they use very gen gentle, non-toxic ingredients. It's important to intervene as soon as you see some kind of insect on your plant. If you intervene quickly, you're able to use the more gentle uh, cultural controls that are easy to do. If you wait till the plant gets infested, then you have to use a chemical control. You often have to go outside to use it. The uh, chemicals can be toxic. You need to store them in a safe place. It's a lot of bother. It's better to act quickly and use a gentler approach. Now, insects often arrive on newly purchased plants or on plants that have spent the summer outside. So before you purchase a plant, it's very important to examine that plant to make sure that it's clean. And always isolate newbies for a few days before placing them near other plants. If you're bringing a plant in from the outside, you need to wash it off thoroughly with a good squirt of water to make sure that there are no uh, visitors that are going to come into your house. And you're also going to isolate it for a few days to make sure that it's okay. Now I'm going to give you a few strategies for handling the most common insect pests. The first one we're going to talk about is aphids. It's possible to pick off visible insects, but it's likely that you're going to miss some. And that's true with all of the insects we're going to talk about. So for aphids, it's good to wash the stems and the leaves, tops and bottoms, with warm soapy water using a brush or a cotton swab. I like to use a cotton swab because it's disposable. I don't want to take a chance of contaminating the brush. After it's all nicely soaked up, take it over to the sink and use your sprayer attachment to rinse the plant with warm water. It's important to always use warm water because cold water, as I said, causes your plant to go into shock. Next up, spider mites. They're really tiny. So that a strong spray of tepid water will dislodge them from small plants. Plant is small, it's easy to examine, it's a quick way to get rid of them. However, for large plants, you're going to have to wash and rinse as for aphids because they have more places to hide. Next is scale. Those hard shelled insects that adhere very tightly to the tops of leaves, the bottoms, and the stems. To get rid of scale, you need to gently rub them off the leaves with warm soapy water using a small soft toothbrush. And then you rinse the leaves with a spray of tepid water. Next is mealybugs. Here, you have to dab the bugs with a cotton swab dipped in rubbing alcohol to slow them down. And then you wash and rinse the plants as for aphids. Well, we've all seen whitefly, unfortunately, and they're very hard to get rid of because they're mobile and they bounce from plant to plant. So the first time you see a whitefly, you take that plant and you wash it with a strong spray of tepid water and be sure to spray the underside of the leaves. They like to hide there. Now, because they're so mobile and very good at hiding, and when you're cleaning, they can actually fly away, stay in the air and land back on the plant after you go. It's good to buy some yellow sticky traps to put in the pot to pick up stragglers. This is a picture of a sticky trap. It's not the only kind you can buy. And the uh, yellow part, you stick in the soil, you leave the butterfly part uh, sticking up. It has stickiness on both sides and the white fly adheres to it. And because these guys are pretty mobile, it's a good idea to put a few traps in the plants that have been alongside the plant that was affected. This way you make sure you've gotten all of them. Well, now we come to the fourth part of our prescription, observation. But you can't be a good observer unless you understand plant language. Plants always tell you what they need, not with words, but through their behavior. Symptoms appear slowly, and that's why it's important to observe on a regular basis. 
And the winter time is the worst time for the plants because it's the heart of our heating season and there's less sunlight available to the plant. How would you like to test your skill at observing your plants and using good plant language? Let's try it. I have a little quiz. I think it'll be fun. Look at this plant. Leaves are dropping right off it. What is that plant trying to tell you? Does the plant need more fertilizer? Is there not enough humidity? Is there too little light? Or has this plant been overwatered? What do you think? I'll give you a minute. Ready with an answer? Here it is. The air is too dry. There's not enough humidity. Let's try another one. Brown tips on leaves. Now we've all seen this. What do you think the plant is saying? Has there been too much light? Was there an abrupt change in temperature? Not enough humidity? Or does the plant need some fertilizer? Think about it. Here's the answer. Surprise. Round tips on leaves have several causes. That's why we see it so much. It could mean there's not enough humidity. There's been an abrupt temperature change. The plant's not getting enough light, but the main culprit is overwatering. How about this? Spindly growth with yellow leaves. Uh, it doesn't look like a healthy plant, does it? What do you think it's saying? Does it need more humidity? Does it need more fertilizer? Does it need more water or is it not getting enough light? Here's the answer, not enough light. To get healthy green leaves, we need sunlight and photosynthesis. So without enough sunlight, no photosynthesis, no green. How about this plant? It has scorched leaves and very pale foliage. What is it telling you? That there's been an abrupt temperature change, that it needs more fertilizer, that there's too much light, or that it needs more humidity. What do you think? And the answer is too much light. The sun has actually burned the leaves. So you need to put that plant in a little darker area. Next, wilting yellow leaves. This poor plant is in a state of collapse. And I know that if you pulled on the stems, they would come right out of the soil. So what do you think is wrong? Is this root rot from overwatering? Does the plant need fertilizer? Is there too little light? or too much light? I think you're gonna know this one. Of course, it's root rot from overwatering, something we really don't wanna see in our plants. And here's the last one, crispy brown wilting leaves. So what is this plant telling you? Does it need more fertilizer? Does it need need more light? Isn't it getting enough water? Or is it root rot from not getting, from getting too much water? This one, I think we all know. Of course, it's not getting enough water. I want you to notice that giving more fertilizer was never the right answer. Now, don't worry if you didn't get them all right, because now that you've seen this, you can remember it from next time. Well, now you've finished your course in Houseplants 101. You know exactly what to do to have healthy houseplants. You, know, you need to know your environment, know your plant's needs, customize the plant care routine according to the information you have about your plant and you need to observe your plants regularly. 
Before we break for questions, I want to talk about the bibliography. You should have gotten an attachment of the bibliography with your Zoom invitation. You notice that on one side, I have websites and on the other side, I have books. If you want the latest and greatest information about houseplants, websites are a very good source. There are a lot of very good ones that are devoted just to houseplants and that's where you can get your plant profile. Now, the websites are good because houseplants are kind of like home decor, they go out of style. So the plants that you see profiled there are always going to be available for purchase. The books on the other hand, not so much. They're very, very good for reference, for learning basic techniques for plant care. These are classics. I actually bought them used because they were the books that I really wanted. And I do refer to them for information from time to time. However, the plants they talk about are often not available for purchase. So it's good to be familiar with how to use a website as well as buying a good book if that's what you choose to do. It's good to have a balance between the two. Finally, this is our disclaimer. I showed you a lot of products during this talk and I don't want you to think that we're endorsing those particular brands. You can buy whatever you want. All right, it's time for questions. All right, I'm trying to bring up the chat box. Sorry, when you closed your screen, I couldn't see anything. Uh oh, my screen just went blank. What did I do? Um, actually, there are no questions in the chat box. Okay, that's fine. They just answered as you went. So some people, you know, they talked about what the, you know, what was wrong with the plants in the pictures. Let's see, there might be a question here. Oh, wait, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> If you want to unmute at this time, since there's um there's only 40 people on, if you want to unmute and ask your question, that would be great. Yes, this is uh, Dawn. Do we need to test uh, um, the soil when we are doing houseplants like we do in our yards? No, because you, you know what your houseplant mix is, right? Oh, so okay, going... okay. But, you know, say if I have an old one or, you know, how, you know, sometimes we do an exchange of plants. Mm -hmm. So it's not because you. I was a renter now on my home, but because when I rented, I had planters. I wasn't going to leave my planters, you know, in that next house. So that's why I was just asking if you had to test your your plants, you know. Uh, I've never way. found that to be necessary. Oh, okay, okay, good. <laughs> uh, there is a question. Um, how do you clean ferns? Um, again, if you use. I really invested in an artist brush. I went down to Michael's and bought one. And it's really very good and it's very soft. And so all you do is just very gently, you know, brush off the dust if you see it. And uh, I usually like to mist my ferns and that keeps them clean as well as moist. Um, so there's another question but, here. Oh. <laughs> Oops, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to follow up. So I'm talking about the, the I don't know the correct name, like the, I call, they, they look like needles on them, like the needle oh. ferns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't have like big leaves. The leaves are like tiny. I mean, they're tiny. I see. So you well, maybe they don't need to be dusty. You know, you look at your plant and see if it looks dusty. Do you know what I mean? Like those flat leaf plants with wide leaves, you can actually see the dust on them and you know enough to dust it off. But if the needles don't look dusty, you don't have to worry about it. I'm bringing it. I'm, well, I'm bringing it in from outside in the house. And you mentioned cleaning them before you bring them in. So Wash just, them off. just spray it off. Wash them off with water. Yep. Okay. Thoroughly. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was another question. What is the purpose of stones in the saucer? It's to keep the plant dry, because the tops of the stones are going to be dry. But the evaporating water under those rocks is going to increase the humidity around the plant. Another question is, if I have a water treatment system in my house, what do you recommend I do to water my house plants? 
what I do, I use, I use gray water. So I use water that's left over from my cat's bowl. Um, I don't use it from the tap and I collect it in a uh, jug, a plastic one gallon jug. And I just let all those chemicals evaporate before I use it to water my plants. So maybe saving some water and letting it sit for a while would be a good idea. Um, Nancy is asking, can we have a copy of the slides? Why not? Well, won't it be on the website too? It's going this, to be the recording will be not your actual um, PowerPoint. We don't share your PowerPoint, but we do share the recording. Oh, um, um, I, can, I can I can take since I have your PowerPoint, I could take it and put it into an outline form and share that with people so that they can have the text if you if you don't mind. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, we don't usually send the PowerPoints because it's really the files are really, really huge and um, yours wasn't too bad, but sometimes they are and there is just too much to try to send through email um, and they always have access to the recording when it's when it's ready. Um, there's a comment directly to me. Thanks for a great presentation, especially how to listen to what my plants are telling me and um, so Barbara asked again so tap water is not good for for uh, watering your plants? No, uh, because they usually are chlorinated, your, your tap water, and that's not always good for plants. And I so by just letting it sit for a while, it evaporates out. It depends where you live. So if you have a private well, you should be fine. But if you live right. in town, um, you know, or, or have city water, then, you know, that's when you don't really want to water your plants with those, with that water, right? But if you have a well, you should be a-okay, usually. And I'm a big one for saving water and using gray water. Like if you're rinsing vegetables or things like that, gallons of water going down the drain, and that always bothers me. So I try to capture that water and keep it aside from my plants. It's funny, I have a little story. So we, we had a, um, a display for the master gardeners at the fair and you know they're, they're used to a certain water well then i just started using the water right out of the sink and in harrington and it's it's super chlorinated like you can smell it and the plants all just kind of they were not happy by the end of that week they looked horrible and and it you know the lack of light that they had by being in the building and then having that chlorinated water they were not happy so um I heard you cannot use soft water for your plants. Is treated house water soft water? Would be. I, I really don't know. I've, I've never had a water softener in my house. Does anybody else know? I really don't know. I know they use salts, different salts that so might not be good for the plants. You know, they use like water, they use chemicals to soften the water, different type of salts. So it might be good for us and our hair and everything, but maybe affect the plants. I can talk to that. I have a water softener mm -hmm. and most water softeners will use sodium chloride, right. table salt, which is harmful. Uh, if you have a water softener with potassium chloride, you can try using that, but the potassium shouldn't be as bad as the sodium salt. So what do you do? Do you buy may, water? May I? May I interject i'm sorry anything that ends in aid that's that's in your water or in i n e chlorine iodine they're using all kinds of the eans to apply the water and they're using the ides the ides to soften it if you're adding softener you would know it because you have to do that you actually have a reservoir we had it in illinois and i had to buy, buy blocks of salt at the grocery store to put them in a tank next to my water because the water was so hard the only way you can get rid of either the ides or the uh eans is to hold the water for a week or more, you can pour the water that you're going to use <clears throat> to water your house plants into some kind of a container, and that stuff will evaporate. 
but it's taking longer and longer because the chemicals that they're using to soften and purify the water are harder and harder to disperse. They want the water pure and they're adding these chemicals and they're harder to get rid of. It used to be that you could take a gallon of water, just leave it, you, you fill it the week that you water and then you use it the next week and you've let it, it it's evaporated and just dissipated. But that is getting harder to do. And the softening, you know it's happening. The iodine, the chlorine, things like that are coming through your water system System, so you don't know what's in there, but I guarantee you there, there are. Fluoride is another one that they're adding to water for the kids, for their teeth. A lot of municipalities are doing that. So those chemicals are hard to get rid of. Thank you. Interesting. You know, I, I have a well, so I never really think about it. But, um, you know, if you, if you live in town and you've got, you know, city water, I, you know, that's something, uh, another challenge you have to have there. Um, so uh, uh, Cynthia put in here, um, I do not use my indoor water, but I use water from my well. Um, and then uh, Debbie also put in the chat box, the link to the evaluation. So please uh, click on that link and let us know um, what you liked and what you'd like to see differently. And uh, thank you so much, Linda, for a great presentation. Okay, thank you. Yeah.